I want to begin by thanking Brittany Lundeen and the Transfer Center staff for affording me this opportunity to speak at this wonderful event. Transfers, look upon those who've gathered here in your honor. Friends and family, esteemed board members, administrators, deans, professors, counselors, and staff. It is the love of educational excellence in particular, the celebration of those who've excelled through so much that brings us to this event. A threshold of sorts, as it is both an exit and an entrance. Please allow me to share a few words about my own transfer experience and how that experience taught me something about myself and the students I now teach at Cerritos, who I pray will accomplish their educational goals just as you have. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether tis nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them, to die, to sleep, no more. And by asleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep, to sleep, perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause there's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. Now, I did not write that. <laughs> but I'd like to start this speech, as you might expect an English professor would, with some famous words uttered by a famous character from one of the most famous works of literature in the English language. Supposedly, it's English, but not the kind we use nowadays. And that was only a portion of the young Prince of Denmark's emo soliloquy. The rest of it doesn't get any happier. So why kill the mood of our transfer celebration <laughs> with some sad fancy pants passage? And what the hell does a rub mean anyways? A little about that later. For now, suffice it to say that this passage comes from Hamlet a work I studied in one of the first classes I ever took after transferring from one UCLA, University of Cerritos, left on Alondra, <laughs> to the other one in Westwood. And it embodies uh, my struggle with that experience. While most other students were probably down or apathetic about showing up on a Thursday afternoon in late September for the first meeting of our Shakespeare's Later Plays course, I was thrilled. Of course, I had already scouted out the location of the classroom, first level of Kinsey, now called the Humanities Building, to the east of Powell Library, and one of the first four buildings that made up the original 1920s campus. Yes, I remembered what the tour guide said a year earlier, but then it was a fantasy, and now it was real. I had arrived 15 minutes early, just as my mother encouraged me to do, to make sure I got a seat. But the room was locked, so I waited in the hall. And I was not alone. Another overprepared student, driven by an anxious desire to start out a new journey by being punctual, was there too. She was cute. <laughs> Picture a 20-year-old Kiara Knightley, that girl from Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> Yes, she was from England, actually a transfer from the University of Exeter. Wow, I think I've heard of that distant place where history is revered and knowledge is sacred. Sounds old world and full of pomp and sophistication. She must be sophisticated. I mean, she's British, right? <laughs> that accent says it all. And I don't mean the grating cockney you'd hear that makes you think of soot chimney sweeps, and raucous soccer matches between Manchester United and Arsenal. 
I mean a voice that resonated with the sweetness of tea and cookies, the spoonful of sugar without the medicine to go down. But still, Mary Poppins was proper, and she knew decorum and tradition. And this was a Shakespeare class. Why was she enrolled in a Shakespeare class? Don't they teach that in first grade over there? <laughs> Isn't that like the national anthem for them? All English toddlers must read Romeo and Juliet, and by the end of preschool must be able to recite Hamlet's to be or not to be soliloquy? I actually thought the English walked around greeting each other with Elizabethan salutations like good morrow and bidding farewell with witty couplets about parting being such sweet sorrow. This is all to say I was on her turf and I needed to keep up appearances. Somehow, I managed to escape the encounter, dignity intact, which I almost jeopardized with a nervous attempt at a British accent, some line or another from Monty Python's The Holy Grail. <laughs> Point USA. The American boob made small talk with an uppity Brit. But she wasn't uppity at all. And the chat was pleasant. Class began. Our professor, an eminent Renaissance literary scholar, no doubt, deigned to enter the classroom with the masses. No eye contact expected. His intellect poured out in rays of light, filling the dark corners of that vast, empty abyss between my ears. His words sounded like the strums from an angel's harp, healing my ignorance with every heavenly note that landed upon me in each well-turned phrase. I mean, that's what I heard. Those heavenly notes, however, soothed my neighbor two desks over into a sweet slumber. I was enthralled by the professor's extended account of King James ascending to the throne in 1603, thus beginning the Jacobean period, an era often used as a demarcation point in the second half of Shakespeare's career, when the genre shifted from comedy to tragedy, history, and romance. Whether the account was going to be on the final or not, I didn't care. Our professor would admit with some self-deprecating humor that a student had described him as vexingly abstract. I mean, come on, even the petty student snark at UCLA smacked of high-mindedness. Such an evaluation was not likely coming from my neighbor, who seemed to live the very words of American transcendentalist Henry David Thoreau, who once said of a woodsman, the intellectual giant was sleeping deep within and without in his case. Fine, his loss. Well, had my Thoreauvian woodsman been awake and had he been inclined to be observant, he might have noticed my eyes welling up with water. The brilliant professor had told the story of the coronation of King James with such feeling and passion that I caught his intellectual enthusiasm. And it welled up inside me and came out as joy. Yes, my eyes get watery pretty easily. It's my disposition. I wear my heart on my sleeve for all to see, and I got it from my dad, who could at once reflect with devilish pride on many a schoolyard fight in his younger years, but also shed a tear when one of Bach's cantatas played. True though it may be that I inherited my misty eyes from him to say that I wasn't moved because of all of the years of hard work and all the dreaming of my life that drove that hard work leading to this moment would be false. I had made the arduous climb up the steps and finally I reached the top of the ivory tower that I had heard about and for me the view was overwhelming. My dream had come true. I had arrived, but I was edgy. So what if Kate was British? She was a student just like me, looking to fit into a new place. I mean, I had the comfort of being in my backyard. My family was 30 minutes away. She was the one thousands of miles from home. So what if our professor was brilliant and pedantic? He teared up reading King Lear, just like my dad would when something beautiful spoke to his soul. So what if the kid next to me took a snooze? I had nodded off in my fair share of math classes. But this competitive stance carried on throughout that first fall quarter. 
I was especially anxious before submitting my first paper. I mean, this was the big time. I had transferred to a four-year university. Serious business and high standards, right? I mean, I could do well in my community college classes, but how was I going to do in my university classes? Whole nother animal. So when it came time for paper conferences, an opportunity for me to talk with my teaching assistant, think the priestly intermediary between us mortal students and our godly professor. I thought it was going to be a confession of my compositional sins that could only be absolved with a complete rewrite purified of my stupidity. I braced myself for the stern look of disapproval and final judgment, but neither came. Instead, the TA said, I did a good job. If anything, she thought I could tone down the amount of evidence I was packing into each paragraph. Where I had expected damnation, I found consolation. In time, I came to realize that I felt really insecure. Upon reflection, I noticed a competition deep within me. And it came from my desire to prove that I belonged. My insecurity about belonging somehow made me feel like I was less, like I snuck in through some back door when no one was looking, like I was an imposter who made it, like I was an unobserved admissions mistake that somehow accidentally received the seal of approval from some exhausted reviewer who either fell asleep amid his giant stack of applications or just caved in and said, OK. As a phony, my unworthiness would surely be revealed in each paper that I turned in. It was just a matter of time before they found me out and I was sent packing. Despite whatever creative and original thought I believed my papers lacked, I was pretty good at inventing ways of dismissing my worth and my work. It's horrible to feel like every day is a test that you can never really pass. I just wanted to be accepted, but I started to understand that that was something I was withholding from myself. When I thought about my TA's comments, I immediately realized that my training at Cerritos had prepared me well. In fact, it had more than prepared me to succeed through my transfer experience. Though there are many professors to thank, I was an English major, so I give special praise to Dr. Frank Nixon and Dr. Linda Palumbo. Yeah. <clears throat> I earned either a B or a B minus on the first papers I completed for their classes. And you know, that really pissed me off. <laughs> but I used that feeling and energy to increase my effort, find new strategies, and seek help from others, what some today call intelligent practice. And I grew. I learned about burden of proof, how to take a stand, back it up with plenty of support, and evaluate the argument, vigilant of fallacies like the hasty generalization or the non sequitur. Any of these might damage the logos, pathos, and ethos of my paper. I've thanked them personally before, but it's a gift to be able to do it in this public forum. From that point forward, I knew I could rest my confidence in the quality of my preparation, and that helped me feel better about fitting in. But there's something else that I could take comfort in, even if I would not have been especially certain of my training, and that was my grit. Grit is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals, a quality characteristic of the successful pursuit of something desirable in the face of obstacles to make it happen. Researchers now maintain that grit is a skill, something that can be developed. It's not some genetic trait, some inborn talent that you either have and are blessed or don't have and are damned. Nope, it's something that you can culture and grow. The fact that I was a transfer student that my journey involved multiple stops and roadblocks along a way less traveled, but ultimately that I persisted in my pursuit and had transferred was indicative of my grit. As a professor here at Cerritos, I see the struggles of my students. 
some whose grit is apparent, and others who can still develop it. One of my favorite parts of the job as a composition instructor is reading my students' work, especially the personal narratives. I get to learn so much about them through our interactions over the course of the semester, but especially in their personal papers. Language embodies beliefs and values, and when I read my students' work, I can see how they think and what they desire. And when they share with me their stories, I'm filled with admiration. <clears throat> Certainly, there are stories about the difficulties of work and managing time, but there are also some harrowing stories about coping with adjusting to a long-deferred return to school, poverty and homelessness, immigration, racism, addiction, abuse, and loss. <clears throat> Not everyone copes with these tremendous obstacles in the most productive ways, and sometimes you just got to take your lumps before you learn. But for those of you who are here, you've faced many challenges and have overcome. You probably have the lumps to prove it, too. You have grit, and that is something very comforting indeed. Just as Hamlet was struggling with the loss of his father, his place in this world, and his very sense of being, I too struggled with my sense of being in a new place. But I refused a tragic ending. I accepted my struggle and continued. Struggle is a part of life, and struggle is necessary for growth. Life will not get easier, so when you set foot in your new world, whenever and wherever, Get comfortable and embrace the struggle so you can see how much you can grow. Congratulations as your journey continues. <laughs>